Good morning. Today's call to worship comes from Psalm 18, verses 30 through 31. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are trustworthy and all your words are true. You are the solid foundation, our rock upon whom we build our trust. You are steady and ever true, always present when we need you most. Let these truths settle in our hearts this day and give us unending peace amid the chaos of daily life and the anxious thoughts that spiral around it in our minds. This we pray in the name of Christ, the solid rock who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing our opening hymn? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust. What is it we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to Zion Church. It's good to see you here. Take a moment to sign the friendship folder and pass it along. I'm going to make a couple announcements, and Nancy and Nicole both have announcements. They're going to head up to the mic as I share a couple. Um, the Harvest Dinner sign up. Remember to sign up. Uh, that's coming up in two weeks. Uh, the meat will be provided. The meat and potatoes uh, will be provided in the dressing, I think. Um, but uh, salads and pies, um, just go by and sign up. Uh, Trent O'Neill will be here. Uh, he's one of our AIM missionaries. Uh, and there's some other events. Steve's going to share a little bit mo more about Trent and his visit in just a moment. Um, Nancy, you want to share about choir? Good morning. I know that this is a busy time for a lot of people. However, it's hard to have choir practice when we only have six people. So I'm encouraging all those who like to sing, come and join us Wednesday night at 7. We also are singing next Sunday. So I would like to encourage everybody, whether you're here today or not, come and join us Sunday or Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Thank you. Big praise will be in the upper room next Sunday, November 3rd at 6 o'clock p.m. So come join uh, for an evening of praise and worship. And Nicole has an announcement about what kids program. It's that time. It's hard to believe we have five Sundays left before our kids Christmas program. That's when Christmas is here. <laughs> December 8th, during the worship service, we'll have our kids Christmas program. Uh, the reason I wanted to make an announcement is uh, there are kids that are in traveling sports, and I would like to have a dress rehearsal, I was thinking, on the Saturday before, but I know there's stuff going on. So the parents that have kids in either swimming or wrestling or traveling basketball, if you can maybe touch base with me about maybe when, what day, it could be a day after school or something, we could have a dress rehearsal and pizza or something that week. And so um, that's one thing I wanted to bring up. The other thing is, is we're looking for a snowflake projector and a lot of people have them on their house when they decorate for Christmas and stuff. They just project snowflakes. Um, if, if anyone has one that we can borrow, that would be amazing. Otherwise, we'll just buy one. They're not that expensive. And then I did also, this is changing hats now. Here's my grandma hat. That was church hat. This is my grandma hat. My son and his wife, Jordan and Carly Sherman, uh, their baby is due November 18th. And her blood pressure has been elevated uh, the last week and then... The, actually the last two weeks and so they're watching her really closely because of that so I would covet your prayers for grandbaby Avery and that everything will go well and it's possible they may even induce her early if they need to and the second part of that is um, we're going to go visit them of course when she's born and if anyone would like to do a freezer meal for them we're going to load up our coolers full of freezer meals to help them out those first couple weeks so if anyone would like to make a meal and freeze it I will pick it up from your house or you could drop it off here at the church I just work next to the church and that would be amazing so thank all you right. <laughs> all right thanks Nicole and we will be praying for for mama and baby uh, this Tuesday the ladies will be filling the cookie boxes to mail to the, our college and military kids so if you signed up to make cookies please have them to the church by 10 a.m. on Tuesday morning also if you're able to help out with the boxing They'll start that at 10 a.m. Any that cover everything on that? And if anyone has needs of help, then they oh yes. Have tons of names and that okay, Danine says we don't have a lot of names. We're kind of short on names, so if be sure your kids, grandkids, make sure we have their addresses and their names because um, we don't. It's not always a guarantee that we we have all those. So even if you think we do, go ahead and call tomorrow and make sure we have them and I thought of a couple yesterday so help me remember to see if we have those all right um, lastly uh, we have another event coming up the car care clinic uh, will be Saturday November 9th uh, so um, if you if you're one of the people that volunteered to help out with that just remember that's coming up in a couple weeks uh, the other part of that is if um, if if you need your car serviced, um, 
call and get it signed up. Uh, this is uh, our ministry to um, uh, so maybe some elderly folks who can't service their car or, or, or single mothers that can't service their car. So that's a free service that we offer once a year. Uh, or if you know someone that may, maybe would be blessed by that ministry, uh, tell them about it and have them call and make an appointment. Let's take a moment to greet one another and share the peace of Christ. Okay, I guess everybody is well greeted. Um, I just want to make us all a little more aware of our harvest weekend and harvest offering. It's two weeks from today, so that is really upon us. As Pastor said, we are featuring the O'Neill family this year. Um, go to the next slide, please. All right, there's the O'Neill family, Trent, Lexi, Maddox, Aiden, Silas, Annabelle, and Lily. This year, it will only be Trent. I know they were here a number of years ago, but between school and the expense of moving a family that size, they can't, you know, they're all not coming along. And uh, besides, they're going back to uh, Africa in, sometime in December. And uh, we have never, Sue and I have never met the O'Neill, so I'm anxious to meet them. And the pressing need for the O'Neills is a vehicle, but I'll get back to that in just one minute. If you could go to the next slide, I just want to share a bit about them. They serve with Africa Inland Mission in the southern region. They've been serving on the islands north of Madagascar in the Indian Ocean. They are part of two creative access teams, or were, on those islands. And what they were doing is teaching English and then doing some Bible story translations. And they were just starting to do some Bible translations. This is in a, a very Muslim context. Um, all right, next slide. They've got change coming to them, though. Their, their son Maddox has been um, diagnosed with a, a brain-related medical issue, so they can no longer remain isolated on the, on the islands. They need access to, to uh, medical care on a more regular basis. So upon their return, they will be serving in Johannesburg, South Africa, with Sepong Basupi, who was here last July. Trent's been um, appointed as the regional administrative officer, so he will be working directly with the teams in the southern region, and that includes Lesotho, where Sue and I had been. So let's go to the next slide, make sure. Now, a vehicle is their big need. Um, that's a family of seven, and this year's harvest offering, we're going to go send that towards a vehicle for them. AIM has set up a uh, special project fund for a vehicle for them. Now, Trent was recently in South Africa attending meetings and in looking around at the market, they're gonna need about $20,000 for a reliable vehicle. 
I don't want to mention that reliable is even more so there than for here. We break down on the side of the road, it's an inconvenience, but you don't want to break down on the side of the road in South Africa and particularly after dark. That was always one of my fears when we went into South Africa and driving back in the dark that we would have a mechanical issue because we always had questionable vehicles. And, uh, but once we crossed the border in Lesotho, we were quite comfortable again. Now, if you can go to the last slide, looking ahead to Missions Weekend, and this is a repeat two weeks from today, November 10th. Carol and her cook team are uh, preparing the meat and the potatoes. So we're gonna need salads and pies, or desserts. To me, that means pies, lots of pies. And so, um, We'll have a combined Sunday school that week. Trent will do the message here at church. And there'll be a brief wrap up at the Sunday evening dinner. So if anybody's interested in visiting with Trent, let me know and we'll make arrangements to get you together. So finally, he arrives on the, the 6th of November, departs the Monday after harvest weekend on the 11th. So. Uh, Looking forward to it. It's an important time of year and an exciting time event for me. Thank you. Our uh, scripture reading comes from Romans 12, 1. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God.
Yeah.
fall. It's a season of change. What was once vibrant and thriving now turns to faded shades of brown, yellow, and red. In this season of change, creation cleanses itself, purging the dead weight, preparing for a new season. And we are offered this simple reminder that we too are called to this change. You see, Paul writes, those who cleanse themselves from what is dishonorable will be a vessel for what is honorable, being set apart, made holy, ready for God to use for every good work. We are called to be set apart, holy, other, being conformed to the image of our Lord Jesus, sanctified, glorified, made new. We are called to this season of change. During this uh, month of October, we've been uh, examining what I said, uh, the big problem of humanity. And we touched upon it the first week, and every week we've touched upon it again. And we've, we've talked about, we've established, I think, that, that our problem, our big problem, our real problem, and all problems that come from it, is sin. Uh, that's the problem of humanity. And we've also established that there's not one part of us that hasn't been affected by the fall of sin. That every part of humanity has been touched by it tainted by it. And we've also recognized that we, in and of ourselves, can't do anything about our problem. On our own, we can't solve it. But the good news is, God does. And that's what we've been talking about each and every week, is about God's solution to our problem. Thankfully, we have a God who is love and who loves us. And in his love, he graciously gave us the gift of his son. By the grace of God, we have been saved. Because his son took the punishment for our sins to make us right and just before God. This act of Jesus Christ taking our punishment, uh, the punishment that we deserve because of our sin, that act accomplished for us the justice required so that we could have the, joy, jo- the hope and joy of eternal life. So in theological terminology, we've covered this month the doctrines of total depravity, the doctrine of salvation by grace alone, and last week's justification by faith alone. And just quickly to touch upon them again, total depravity says that we are dead in our sins. We are helpless on our own to save ourselves from our sin. Salvation by grace alone points to the fact that it is God's gift, God's gift of love that saves us. And justification by faith alone is the fact that by having faith in Jesus Christ and his atoning work on the cross, having faith in Christ, faith alone, faith in Christ alone, And what he did for us. That's what makes us right before God. That's what makes us just. That's what makes us appear to be righteous. Today we're going to cover one more theological term. And it's meaning for our lives. And that term is sanctification. Sanctification is the process by which anything is made holy. Uh, And we're talking about ourselves. So it's the process by which we, can you believe it? The process, there's a process that we actually become holy, set apart for God, made sacred. And, and the goal of our sanctification is that we become more Christ-like. We become more like Christ. Now, one more thing to say about these theological terms that, that we're covering, salvation by grace alone, justification by faith alone, uh, now sanctification, they're all, they're all part of God's one solution for us. God's solution is salvation. 
And all these things are things we talk about that help us to understand how God works for us. It's all part of salvation. Salvation by grace alone, justification by faith alone, sanctification that we're talking about today. It's all salvation, God's work for us. I might add also that you can also see how it's Trinitarian, right? God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is at work in our salvation. God the Father in his love sent his Son to die for us. We have faith in Christ and his redeeming work on the cross and in sanctification. The Holy Spirit is in us, working on us, working in us to bring about that holiness, that perfection that God desires in us. Sanctification is a particular aspect of the Christian teaching of salvation, and it's a present experience of salvation. It's a present experience of salvation. It's a process of transformation. It's it's an experience that happens to a person after they trust in Christ as their Lord and Savior after God's loving acceptance of them into his family. And to understand sanctification, it's helpful to distinguish it from justification. As I said, justification and sanctification both relate to our salvation. They're both part of the good news that God saves us by his grace. Both justification and sanctification are received by faith. But there's three important distinctions Number one, justification is legal. Sanctification is transformational. Justification is being declared righteous or being declared just. But sanctification is a process of being made holy. Number two, justification happens all at once. Sanctification happens over a lifetime. As a a change in status, justification, which we talked about last week, is immediate, and it's final and complete. Nothing needs to be added to our justification. Nothing can be added. It's done. In Christ Jesus, you are declared righteous in Him. Sanctification as a process in progress is God's own ongoing work in us or on us. And the third distinction between the two is uh, Jesus' work is the grounds for our justification. We're talking specifically about what Christ Jesus did for us on the cross. That's the grounds for our justification. Jesus' life is the pattern for us in sanctification. In sanctification, Jesus' life provides a pattern, a template for us to look at, for us to follow. And in that sanctification, God is transforming his people over time so that we resemble Jesus more and more. Let me give you a few scriptures this morning that's going to direct our thinking uh, on this doctrine of sanctification and eventually will lead us to the doctrine of good works. In the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus said, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, I trust that there are many of you today who have found this verse bothersome, right? Be perfect? Are you kidding me? It bothers us, right? Because we all know that perfection is impossible, especially if you add to it what Jesus adds. Be perfect, not just be perfect, but by the way, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So that's bothersome because we all know we can't measure up to our Heavenly Father. And yet we can't just dismiss Jesus' command to be perfect. There's a reason why he said it. 
So if we can't dismiss it, we need to understand it within the context of the New Testament as a whole, within the context of Jesus teaching his disciples as a whole. The New Testament says as much about a transformed way of living and a, transformed, a transforming way of living as it does about receiving God's grace and mercy and forgiveness. Sanctification points out that we measure how we live not according to our standards or the world's standards, but we look to our Heavenly Father as the standard. We're aiming at, what, at who God is. We're aiming for the attributes of God. Knowing, of course, we're never going to be God. And we're not going to be perfect like God. But who are we aiming for? Who is our standard? Our standard is not grandma, as wonderful as she is or was. It's not mom or dad. It's not the best preacher you ever knew or the best teacher you ever had or the the, the best coach you ever had. It's not Mother Teresa or Billy Graham. It's not a professional Christian athlete that you look up to. It's not a politician. Certainly not a politician. <laughs> We're aiming for the attributes and the qualities of our Heavenly Father. And any person we might look up to and, and learn from it's only because we see in them that they, too, are a person that we admire because of how they are aiming for the Heavenly Father. In Philippians 2, 12 through 13, the Apostle Paul writes this, and this, this helps us to think about how we aim for the qualities and attributes of God. Paul writes this, he says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who has a work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Paul's use of the Greek verb that is rightly translated to work out is consistent in his writings. He uses this verb 20 times in his letters. And I think it's key to keep in mind this, that Paul is not saying work for your own salvation. He's saying, work out your own salvation. To further go into this, let's, let's imagine something. Let's imagine the consistory. Your fine uh, elders and deacons uh, decide that yours truly, your pastor, is not in as good physical shape as he could be. And so they, they graciously and generously um, give me a membership to the Warland Health Club as a way of saying, hint, hint, pastor. You're, you're, not, you're not looking very healthy. We need you to kind of strengthen up yourself. And so they give me this gift, so kind of them. And, um, but after, after six or seven months, they're at consistory meeting, and they're all thinking the same thing. They're thinking, you know what? Pastor James is just not looking as buff as we thought he would after six or seven months at the health club. And they, they even asked me to flex, and they, they measure my body weight index and all that stuff. I mean, it's getting a little personal here. Um, and they say, Pastor, you know, it just doesn't seem like the health club's helping you out. And I say to them, well, that's because I'm not going and working out. You see, their gift, their, their gift did not change my physical health or my physical appearance because I wasn't working out. I wasn't utilizing the gift that they gave me. The same can be said of our free gift of salvation. If, if we excuse our personal responsibility to work out our salvation, or you might want to say, this might help even more, to work out of your salvation. If you, if you refuse those opportunities to work out your salvation, if you excuse yourself from it, then your life will obviously not show 
those results that you would hope for or that someone else might hope for in you. We won't show or experience all the blessings and benefits of salvation. We're still saved by God's grace, but we're not experiencing the fullness that we can if we work out our salvation or work out of our salvation. When I started coaching high school sports seven years ago, um, and I did basketball for seven years and softball for two years and baseball for one, but, but as I started coaching high school student athletes, I noticed that I started viewing them differently. So for years, I'd, ever since I graduated from high school, I guess, I viewed high school student athletes based upon what I saw when the Friday night lights came on, right? I was sitting in the stands, I was a fan, and I was judging everything or just enjoying as a fan and cheering on everything based upon what was happening when the Friday nights were on or, or, or when the, they hit the hardwood and, and all the fans were there and the rival came uh, from 45 minutes away for that game. But as I started coaching high school sports, and it was different from when I was helping out with, with my own kids, and we'd have a couple practices a week, maybe. But when you start having practices and you're around student athletes six to seven days a week over the course of many months, you start viewing student athletes differently. And I realized that I started viewing them based upon whether or not they were living up to their potential in practice. And Friday night or Saturday night or whenever the games were, I'm not saying it didn't matter, of course games matter, but I realized it mattered less, and in fact, that mattered less to me than what I saw six days or seven days out of the week when I saw them practicing. I found that that mattered more to me, and I started viewing the student athletes based on that. Were they living up to their potential in practice? Because after all, if the student athletes weren't living up to their full potential in practice, then it wasn't going to look very good anyways on Friday night or Saturday night. I tend to view sanctification in a similar way. Are we in our faith living up to our potential as Jesus followers in our daily practice? Are we practicing our faith every day so that we're allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us where we need to be? Uh, guiding us in how we should complete our work? Are we living up to our potential as Christians daily? If we are, then we are experiencing God's Spirit's ongoing work in the sanctification in our lives. Paul tends to speak of salvation as both something that has already happened and also something that is still to come in the future. It is God who saves us, but there's also a human responsibility, as he pointed out, Paul pointed out, to work out in our state of being saved. And the passage we've looked at a few times over the past several weeks from Ephesians chapter 2, and we, we've looked at 4 through 8, and I'm, I'm going to pick up again at verse 8, and we're going to read verse 8, 9, and 10. Paul says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So we've talked about that. We've established that. We're saved by God's grace. There's nothing we can do to justify ourselves. There's nothing we have to do after this to justify ourselves. We couldn't anyways. We're saved by God's grace, not by works. And then verse 10. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. One last time. We're saved by God's grace not by works, but Paul points out 
that God's grace saves us for good works. God's forgiveness is complete. Salvation is permanent. There's nothing, there is nothing that can unsave you. But sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit in and throughout a Christian person's life, and it's a continual process that is not completed in human history. The process of sanctification inevitably leads to the production of good works. That's what Paul says. We're God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good works. Our, our works, our works are the evidence, or you might say the fruit of the Spirit. It's the evidence that God's in us and God's working on us and God's working through us. In Ezekiel 36, 27, we read the Lord's declaration. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. According to the prophet Ezekiel, what or who is the cause of our obedience? Is it us? No. It's God's indwelling spirit. It's God's Holy Spirit that causes us to walk in his statutes, that leads us to obey God's rules, that will lead us into good works, good deeds, that will produce the fruit out of our lives. God, God's spirit, is the cause. The effect of God's pouring his Holy Spirit in us that we, is that we will obey his rules and do his good works. God is the cause. Our lives are the effect. Once we've been saved and renewed by God's grace, the effects of God's work within us begin to manifest themselves. Remember Paul's words one last time. For we are God's handiwork. What, what about if we use the word masterpiece there? Is that hard for you to think about? You're God's handiwork. You're God's masterpiece. And, and you're created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared for us to do. The marvelous truth of sanctification is that we are God's handiwork, God's workmanship, God's masterpieces, and created in Christ Jesus. But, but as we walk in our faith and as we obey God, being led by the Spirit, it's a wonderful truth also that we're still being sanctified. God's still working on us. We've already been made God's workmanship, but God's not quite done with us. Yes, yes. The wonderful, the wonderful truth of sanctification is God's not done on us. God's Spirit's still working on us. Still making us better. Making us more holy, more perfect, more like Christ. When the famous Italian artist Michelangelo looked at a particular piece of marble, he saw what ended up being his sculpture, Angel Holding a Candelabra. When Michelangelo was asked about this specific piece of art by someone, and, and, and they asked, how, how could you take a piece of marble and create such a beautiful masterpiece. Michelangelo said, I saw the angel in the marble and I carved until I set him free. When God looks at our lives, he doesn't just see what we are right now or what we can do right now. He also sees what we can be. We are his handiwork 
still in his hands. We are his masterpieces still in the master's work. It's, it's surprising, isn't it? It's surprising to me when I think about myself. And I think it's surprising probably to all of us. Astounding that God sees us as beautiful, valuable, uh, his handiwork. And in his grace and love, he's always seen us this way. And you say, well, pastor, I'm no angel holding a candelabra. And I say, no, you're not, and neither am I. But God's still working on us. He's not done with us yet. He's not done with you, and he's not done with me. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how long you've been in this, this walk of faith. God's not done with you yet. God's not done with you this morning. He's always carving. He's always, he's always refining those rough spots. He's always sanding down those unfinished edges. He's always, he's always covering up the blemishes until at last, at last, at last, in our death and resurrection, we are set free in our complete and, yes, perfected state. Finally, fully sanctified in Christ Jesus. I've shared these words with you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, you're still working on us, aren't you? We know that full well because we know, we know even in the past week uh, about our blemishes and our mistakes and our errors. You know, you know of things that we've been working on for years. Lord, this day, I, I pray that you would remind us all that it's not us that needs to be working on us. It's us allowing your Holy Spirit to take more and more control of us. It's about humbling ourselves and allowing you to prune where you need to prune and allowing you to sand off the rough edges of our lives that need sanded on. And, and Lord, it, it's your spirit. It's your spirit that's going to make us more and more Christ-like. And we know that can happen this day. So, Lord, work on us. We want to be more holy. We want to be more loving. We want to be more Christ-like in each and every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand for a closing hymn?
receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.